Thank you for joining us. And I'm in Shaker Heights, Ohio, and Donna's in Euclid. And I know a few people are not local, but um, I'm so glad you guys could join us tonight. I am going to talk a little bit about um, my work, my books, and um, projects I'm working on right now, and specifically about uh, my latest thriller, No One's Home. Um, what inspired me to write the story and some of the background on the story. Um, and I'm happy to, we're gonna keep it informal tonight. We're a small group. I'm happy to take questions. Um, please do use the chat, but um, I can see some of you, a lot of your videos off and that's fine. Um, if you wanna turn your video on and, and wave a hand um, at the end, we can also do questions that way, especially if the chat is clumsy for, for some of the folks joining us. So I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you pictures of some of the things that inspire me and, um, and some of the work that I've been doing. So let's see if this works. So this is, um, if you were at a library with me right now, I would have a projector up and a big screen and this would be the, the picture that greets you when you walk into the meeting room. Remember those days? Like it's, I think it's gonna happen again this fall. Um, okay, let's see if I can get, Oh, there we go. Okay. Technology. All right. So the reason why I'm speaking with you tonight, um, I was a reader, a voracious reader and an aspiring writer for years. And I would not be here if I hadn't written this, my first book, The Dead Key. Um, this book was the book that changed my life. I worked on it for four years straight um, from 2010 to 2014. I was writing drafts of it. I was trying to figure out this publishing business. I was trying to figure out how to make a book happen in this world. And as it turns out for me, I was able to get this book out um, through a contest. Amazon um, used to run a breakthrough novel award contest for you know new writers. And it was sort of like American Idol for books. And Amazon, we all know is a bookseller, but they became a publishing house and a publishing powerhouse in the last five years. Um, they are now publishing directly Dean Koontz and Patricia Cornwell and some really big names. Um, but back you know, in 2014, they were still looking for talent and trying to make a name for themselves as a publishing house. And so they ran this contest and I was a big nobody in Cleveland, Ohio with a really big book that um, I'd spent all these years dreaming about and working on. Um, and out of 10,000 entries, the Dead Key was selected as a grand prize winner and was published. And, um, and it was amazing. I, I quit working as a, a engineer for hire for a period of time. My background is I'm an engineer by training, um, not a writer. And how I got into writing, I almost went to journalism school, but I went to engineering school at Case Western instead. And I was very much drilled into my head by my father that you know being able to make a living and support yourself was an important skill. <laughs> so, um, so I, I ended up focusing on engineering, and it it led me into all of these great haunted, old, abandoned, interesting, historic buildings in and around Cleveland. Um, I've worked on Terminal Tower, which is the you know the hallmark building of the Cleveland skyline. I've touched the silver pyramid at Key Tower. I've hung from the sides of buildings for hours at a time in the snow doing inspections. Um, and my specialty was historic old buildings that were crumbling and falling apart. And I worked as an engineer for 10 years um, in the field. And then I worked five more years as a private consultant. And when I left my big engineering job, my, I had two little babies at home and I, it was just getting to be too much. Um, when I left, I decided to try to write this story that I was inspired by back in 2001 from one of my buildings. Um, I worked on an abandoned bank in downtown Cleveland that had a safe deposit box vault in the basement. It had lots of vaults in the basement. The basement was like a maze and it was actually three buildings all connected at the corner of East 9th and Euclid. And um, I was there to keep parts of the building from falling into the street but a lovely engineer that worked there showed me the basement vaults and, and let me know the little secret of the bank, which was that when they shut down and merged with Society for Savings that later became Key Bank, um, all these safe deposit boxes were left behind. 
and they were still full of stuff. And a few had been drilled open and there was rumors about people breaking into them at night and nobody really knew what was inside these safe deposit boxes. And this drove me nuts. I'm a mystery lover. I grew up on Stephen King and John Saul and Agatha Christie. And, and I love um, crime stories and I love dark stories. And I really wanted, I was pretty convinced that those safe deposit boxes had a terrible secret, like photos of the mayor with a dead hooker or something. I mean, I was, that's where my brain goes when, um, when I was looking at this. And so it became the inspiration for the dead key. Um, it took me 10 years to get the guts up to even try writing um, because again, I was an engineer, not, not a writer. And um, so I was shocked. I was absolutely floored when the dead key won this contest and I became a published author. Um, thankfully, I had lots of stories I, I wanted to tell. Um, my next book came out a year later. Um, the buried book was inspired by the disappearance of my grandmother um, in 1949. And it kind of centers around um, this series of tornadoes that tore apart parts of Michigan, north of Detroit, and also parts of Ohio. It was um, June 8th, 1953, millions of dollars of damage, hundreds of people dead, uh, tornadoes like nobody, like nobody had ever seen before. And it just so happened that my father was living on a farm um, with family members after his mother disappeared. And um, he was caught in the aftermath of these terrible storms and caught in the aftermath of the secrecy of why she left and where she went. So I, it was a mystery in, the, in my family's lore and the mythology of, of where I come from. So I, I really wanted to solve it in my own way. And um, so that's where the inspiration for the, this book came from. Um, and then shoot, I was on a roll. I had a book contract with Amazon. They wanted me to keep writing. And I love telling stories inspired by the past, stories inspired by the Rust Belt, stories definitely inspired by old buildings and, um, and dark secrets and organized crime and true crime. Um, the Unclaimed Victim was largely inspired by a place where I'm actually renting a, a writer's retreat right now um, in down to, near downtown Cleveland. It's an old Bible factory printing press and it definitely had the vibes of um, H. H. Holmes's Devil in the White City, the hotel. This is America's one of America's very first serial killers in Chicago during the World's Fair, um, turn of the century. He built a hotel as a death trap maze with secret passageways and doors. Eric Larson's book, Devil in the White City, is a fantastic, for anyone that's a fan of my work, I absolutely recommend um, reading Eric Larson. That book in particular, um, marries architecture and history and murder in a way that I can't resist and um, really inspired me to look deeper into this factory and this group of missionary women that were cloistered there at one point in time, over 200 women were living in isolation in this factory. Um, acting as missionaries. Um, they would sing to the neighborhood from their balconies. Um, they say that you can still hear them singing at night. The building is rumored to be very haunted. And it's also a crazy mashed up. It's 15 buildings all smashed together that were built at different times. And um, I do a fun presentation on this book where I show pictures of the way this building's put together. There are doorways that open into death drops. There are doors sunken in concrete where two buildings meet up. You walk down a hallway and there's all these windows because that used to be an outside wall, but they just built next to it. Uh, it's a real maze. They have over 20 staircases in this maze of a building. And I was inspired by the architecture, of course, but I was also uh, intrigued by the history in the 1920s and 30s when this um, when these women were living there was around the time the torso killer was terrorizing Cleveland. And um, that murders, th those 13 murders attributed to the torso killer um, were never solved. They never found out who the killer was. Um, and I ended up getting sucked in. It was like one of those you know, it's true crime serial killer situations where like I had pictures up on my walls and I was trying to solve the crime. I got, um, I loved I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara. If you have 
heard of it or read it, they did a, um, a documentary on HBO about her and the Golden State Killer and her obsession with solving the crime and her book's a bestseller. It was really well done. Nonfiction, I, it, that, it was very similar for me. I was kind of tracking all the victims. I read like 10 different books on the killer. And I came up with a little theory about how this very interesting building and this killer might have collided. And um, it was a real fun project. I, I just, I got sucked in for eight months doing research. I, I really got down the rabbit hole on that one. And um, my latest, No One's Home, was very much inspired, again, by my work as an engineer, but this time, my work on homes. When I left my corporate job as a commercial engineer working on big high rises, um, I started my own little business helping people with remodeling jobs and dealing with water in their basement like I've got right now, or why aren't their gutters draining, or why is this part of the house leaking, um, how they should spend their money to maintain their old home, how they should spend their money to update it, what, what repairs are worth doing and which ones aren't. Like I did a lot of that type of consulting for homeowners, specifically owners of old homes. And so I spent about five years getting to get to know and, and renovate several old houses in and around Cleveland. Um, and I, every time I walk into a house, I, I, I feel like it has a hundred stories it wants to tell me. Um, there are so many interesting traces of the past inside these old homes from the layers of paint to the holes in the walls, to smoke damage, to new doorways that were cut in and old doorways that were sealed off. Um, it's just, for me, it, I could spend my life just wandering through one old house after another. Um, here's some photographs of a large house I worked on in Cleveland Heights, um, the attic spaces of this house where I was analyzing the structure and trying to help them with a the renovation. Um, it just reminded me of the vampire Lestat or like some, <laughs> Some ghoul must be living up there in these attic spaces. It was um, fascinating. This is from the outside, the back of the house. They had torn off a bad addition and were trying to um, do a more tasteful renovation and expansion. Um, this was a 7,000 square foot home. A friend of mine, still know them very well, dear friends. But this house inspired a lot of Rawlingswood. Um, it's a seven bedroom. 7,000 square foot home that really was big enough to house 20 people. Um, the entire third floor was big enough to house five live-in staff. Um, and it was just a small family living in this house. And what really kind of struck me working on this house while it was empty and under construction, this is after some of the work had been done, was how lonely it felt, how isolated, how, how bizarre to be in a house in to know that someone else could be inside with you and you would have no idea. You would not hear their footsteps. You would not hear their voices. When my children play in this house, we have no idea where they are, <laughs> like, which can be lovely when you're visiting with friends. But um, to me, it was, it was very eerie uh, to be in a, in a space this big. Um, this house was designed for family of you know, eight or you know, eight children, not, not the smaller families of today. And I live in Shaker Heights where there are a lot of these larger homes that have smaller families living inside. And um, I kind of, I, I became kind of obsessed with, with these, these houses and the stories inside them. Um, my renovation business, you know, was doing historically tasteful renovations, you know, bathrooms, kitchens. Um, this is a house I worked on in Lakewood where that you, when you went up the attic steps, you would bang your head on the roof. And so we cut a hole to make a dormer. And that was something I designed. This was for another friend of mine. My goodness, you do not know stress until you cut a 20 foot by 20 foot hole in your friend's roof. I will tell you that, <laughs> that was an interesting project. But this is from the inside, framing out and cutting that hole um, so that they would have a better stairwell. And this became a source of inspiration for my stories because inside the eaves of this house, we found a little boy's shoe, we found a wooden ball, we found a hat, you know, they were just kind of buried in the insulation. And it really struck me 
Well, clearly in the way my brain works is that boy was murdered because we never found the other shoe. And there was some spooky story associated and I could hear that wooden ball rolling across the attic floor when I would be in there by myself had that kind of feeling of someone just over my shoulder while I was doing my job. Now, you know, we could have some of the discussions I've had about this book is whether or not I actually believe in ghosts or, um, I, I think what one of the points of writing No One's Home was to consider and, and really think about what haunting is like and, and what, in what ways are we haunted by our mistakes, by the ones we've lost, by um, by ourselves, by our own demons. Like I, I think that haunting is is really kind of more metaphorical um, for me. But I also think we're all a little superstitious in our own way. Um, I love the idea of there being this little boy sort of lurking in the attic still of my friend's house. Um, I think it adds a sense of I don't know mystery and magic to being up there, and I can't help but feel like I'm hearing things. Um, but I think it's, you know, what we conjure in our brain, what our sense of um, what's real to us, perception is reality. And I, and I do feel like those of us who have lost loved ones, um, you know, I have aunts that swear that certain birds that come visit them in their kitchen window are a lost, you know, father or a lost husband. Um, we, we tend to... Um, I think attribute meaning to things where we need to see meaning. And that's my take on it. I, I, I find it to be very fun and intriguing to think about who the heck this little boy was and what the heck happened to his other shoe. I still wanna know. And why was his shoe in the eaves in the first place? Like what, what happened up there? Um, another source of inspiration for No One's Home came from my own house. Um, my house was built in 1918. And inside my son's closet is this diary of past owners and past children and people that have lived there that goes all the way back to the 70s. And people have left notes and, and some silly, some you know, cryptic, a lot of well wishes. Um, I'm still thinking there's a hidden message in all this somewhere that like if I, if I decode this, there's going to be a, a treasure map or something at the end or a doorway will open to the other dimension. But that's just the way I like to think about things because <laughs> I grew up with an overactive imagination. But um, nobody would paint over this, this, uh, these messages in the closet. This closet has not been painted since 1978 and we won't paint it either. But I, I found it fascinating, the idea that you could leave messages in the bottle for the next people that come along into your house. And I've met a lot of readers that have found messages or little artifacts from past owners. And I love the idea that we all leave a mark on the houses where we've lived. Um, so the actual, another big inspiration um, for No One's Home was a vandalized house. Um, in the 2008 real estate market crash, we decided to buy a new house. Um, we were lucky, my husband and I and my one son at that time, um, to be in a position to buy when the market tanked. And but holy moly, was there a lot of interesting things on the market in 2008. We must have toured 60 houses in Shaker Heights, Cleveland Heights, and Lakewood, but mostly Shaker Heights where we wanted to live. And several of the houses were in poor repair. Um, we saw all manner of terrible renovations, um, houses that hadn't been touched since the 1940s, and a few that had been ripped apart by people looking for copper pipes, by vandals just looking to be destructive. Um, and one of the houses that we went to look at um, was severely damaged. Um, here's some stock footage of, of a, such a house, but um, it was a beautiful 4,000 square foot home in a really nice part of Shaker Heights by the golf course frankly, too nice for us. Like it was not our neighborhood, um, but it was in our price range. So we had to go see it. And what we found um, was a lot of evidence that um, the daughter who had lived there, according to the rumors around the open house, had become a drug addict. Um, the father had died under mysterious circumstances. The mother had 
you know, kind of collapsed under, you know, the emotional distress and the daughter went off the rails and she ripped out the radiators and there were big holes in the wall and paint smear, hot pink paint smeared over the windows. And there was a college acceptance letter sitting on one of the steps going up to the attic of this house that had never been opened. And this girl, this, this troubled girl that, um, you know, went downhill so drastically, like from a private school kind of neighborhood, um, you know, came from a wealthy family and just, you know, spiraled down to um, rock bottom like that and, and, and destroyed the parts of the house in the process. That really struck me. And I wanted to, I wanted to know that girl. I wanted to think about what happened to her and, and what would lead a family down that path. So all of these things were cooking in my brain when I began um, the thinking about writing No One's Home. Um, all these old houses I'd worked on, all of the houses I'd toured, some of the damage I saw, these, this troubled girl that we came across and saw some of the things that she did to the walls and wrote, um, that mixed together with uh, history. I, I'd like to do my historical research because I always find that history is stranger than fiction and usually more intriguing and it's usually a great springboard. Like if I'm gonna write about a real place, which is what I like to do, I like to set my stories in real places. I wanna know about the history and what happened there. So I was doing some research into Shaker Heights, Ohio, where I live. Um, just what was there on the land before the houses sprung up, how they were built, um, what the philosophy of Shaker was. Shaker is a kind of interesting community for those who are not familiar. It's considered one of the wealthiest communities per capita in the country, but it's also one of the most diverse. Um, it's got some of the oldest housing stock in the Midwest. Um, and it's, it's also been very controversial. Uh, Shaker Heights was known as a, a pretty exclusive gated sort of community for a long time where they had covenants where you could not sell to certain people. Um, which that changed drastically in the 60s and 70s. And it's now become a very progressive and integrated uh, place, uh, which is why I love it. But um, it, back in 1905, when they were building Shaker Heights, they promised their buyers protection forever against depreciation and unwanted change, um, which I found kind of interesting. Like the, the suburban promise of your own home, your own castle, uh, around the right kind of people and having a sort of bucolic heaven on earth was what these socialites at Cleveland in the 19 teens and 20s, that's what they were looking for. They wanted to get out of the dirty city. Uh, Cleveland was a big manufacturing center. It was loud. It was messy. It was noisy. They wanted big yards. They wanted their own little slice of heaven. And what was fascinating to me is that um, you know, the Shakers, the original owners of the land, this religious commune, also thought it was heaven. Here's an image of that house. Um, this is one very similar uh, to the one we toured. I think those two slides got mixed up. Um, but you can see Shaker Heights homes are stately. Um, when they were building Shaker Heights, according to these covenants, you had to hire an architect. You could not build from a catalog. You had to build in one of five architectural styles. Um, English styling was preferred, French revival was okay. Um, this is a street near where I live where you can get a sense of the scale and design of these homes. Big slate roofs, all of them had third floors, all of them had servants quarters, including my house. My house is not a, a huge house. Um, we, have a, we have a very small like third floor with a single room and, an, and a bathroom where a live-in nanny or cook would have lived. Um, of course, we don't live like that anymore. Not, neither do my neighbors. The people in these homes don't have live-in help um, by and large. Um, these attics have been turned into rec rooms. They've been turned into storage. They've been turned into HVAC, you know, machinery. Um, but a lot of the houses where I like around Shaker Heights, where I was writing about have back staircases, have um, separate entrances to the kitchen, have, you know, there's a sort of above the stairs, below the stairs, Gosford Park element to 
the way these houses were built before the Great Depression. And every house in Shaker is unique um, from that era. And you can see they're, they're quite sprawling. Imagine living in a house this size with like one child, which is what some people do. And um, the echoes of the hallway and, and the sense of isolation to me is an interesting metaphor for how suburbia can also be isolating. Um, that you might not know your neighbors, that you might feel like a little island unto yourself, um, the way a child might feel like an island in a bedroom in this house. Um, I, I found that very inspiring and interesting. For me, it created a, quite a mood and atmosphere to what I was trying to do in no one's home. Um, I borrowed parts and pieces of houses. Um, it was really fun to draw blueprints from Rawlingswood in no one's home to give the reader a sense of what the house looked like. Um, this big leaded glass window on this house, uh, I imagined being above the front door there. Um, you know, this is another example of uh, the Tudor revival. And, you know, a lot of these houses have kind of a vibe to them. Like, I, this feels like an undertaker's house where he's got something terrible happening in the basement. I'm sure it's a lovely family, but I like to lurk behind trees and, like, look at these houses. Um, and think about what might be going on behind closed doors. I think we're all a little voyeuristic like that. We're all curious what goes on in other families and what's happening in these grand houses. Are they happy? Um, is there a woman slowly dying inside? Is there someone slowly going crazy? Is there a child that is looking to escape? Is there someone there that no one knows is there? You know, that, that, that kind of question really drove a lot of the writing in no one's home. Um, and these houses are also great for mysteries and ghost stories because look at all the nook and, nooks and crannies. Look at all the little places to hide. By the way, the upkeep on this house must be astronomical. I was just looking at all that trim. Um, but one of the things these great shaker houses have that, are, that I love in my writing is they have outdoor staircases like dungeon stairs going down to the old coal closet entrance of the basement. Um, also a great place for children to fall in the backyard. Um, Shaker Heights homes have these great big window wells that sometimes would be covered with bars and sometimes not where the basement is sort of subterranean but built into the grounds and, and there are several entrances into the house again where you might not know if someone's coming or going, um, you certainly would not hear this door open from the other wing of the house. Um, so this, this whole basement staircase door makes an appearance in no one's home. Um, so uh, back to the idea of Shaker Heights, how it was conceived and what it was before, um, I wanted to get into the history of what's happened in Shaker Heights, what kind of ghost stories might exist, what kind of unsolved murders might exist, um, so I did a lot of research into um, some of that history, looking for trends, looking for some sort of pattern that would be interesting. Um, in my research, I learned a little bit about the history of the Shakers themselves. Um, for those of you not familiar, they were uh, Anabaptists, they were millennialists, the Shakers. They believed that the end of the world was coming like today or tomorrow. Um, they went into trances when they would do their, they would march in circles in their prayer dances and enter a fugue state where they would have visions and they would shake and they would invite people to come watch their, their worship so that they could recruit new members because they turned nobody away. Um, widows and former prostitutes and, you know, orphans and anybody that needed a home back in you know, the 1800s in Ohio, there wasn't necessarily other places for these people to go. Um, so they took everyone in, but they would invite people into these, um, to their prayer services and they, and people would watch them and they called them the shaking Quakers um, because of their beliefs and then these, these um, trances. And, you know, in modern times, we look back on the shakers as kind of quaint craftsmen that, you know, worked with their hands. They had a good work ethic. They are known as, uh, their motto was hands to work and hearts to God. And they would make everything by hand, um, rocking chairs, shaker cabinets, handmade dolls. This is some old shaker furniture in the shaker museum that you can look at. Um, but there, to me, there was kind of a darker, more uh, mystic mystic side to, um, to these folks that were living on this land before Rawlingswood was built. 
Um, they thought they'd found heaven on earth. They called it the Valley of God's Pleasure, the corner, you know, at Lee Road and South Woodland. This is an old map of the of the Shaker settlement. And Rollinswood is set on Lee Road, uh, right in the middle of this settlement. Um, when they came to the land in 1822, they were preparing the land for God. They gave up all possessions. They did not get married. They would not have children. They were preparing the fertile soil for God to return. And um, which is, you know, famously why they eventually, their numbers dwindled. Uh, but here's another um, map of the old Shaker settlement. And I got very interested in this because in my reading, I found out that in the Holy Grove, which is shown off to the side here, they believed that at certain times of year, under certain conditions, they could speak to God or speak to angels or speak to dead people. Um, they would try to talk with their founder, Mother Ann Lee, who had been dead for over 100 years, um, when they would enter trances inside the Holy Grove. And it just so happens that Rollingswood is located very close to that land and very close to the original Shaker Cemetery, um, and also very close to several unsolved murders in Shaker Heights. Um, it just, in all my research, it just kept pointing me to this part of Lee Road as being a real hotbed of, um, of interest for what I was looking for. Um, so walking around Shaker, you can still see the, uh, the old sites of some of the, of the settlements of the original Shakers. This is a gate post. Um, the Shaker Historical Society has done a great job putting up landmarks to show us where um, some of the, the original meeting houses and things were for the, the, the Shaking Quakers. Um, there's my dog Hobo. This is very close to the Holy Grove where they felt that they had an antenna to talk to the other side. And um, so who knew at the corner of Lee Road and Shaker Boulevard, you can talk to dead people. Um, so the Holy Grove, this was really the period of mysticism that became interesting to me was uh, from 1840 to 1852 is really when they became the Shakers had a very active period of time. They were trying to write their own Bible, sort of like the Mormons had their book of, you know, the Book of Mormon. They were writing their own um, version of things. They believed they were having direct messages from God and from angels and from the beyond. Um, and they were recording them all uh, in pictures and songs and verse. And they were, um, you know, trying to convert people to this idea that they had this direct line. This is another view of, of that part of Shaker Heights, which is a little open park there at Lee and Shaker Boulevard. Um, so the Divine Book of Holy Wisdom is some of the recordings of what angels told them during their dances and what, you know, what was they were learning from the beyond. I just found it fascinating. As someone, I was interested in a ghost story. I was interested in um, the spiritualism and, and, and a sense of a, a crossing over, like I, I wanted to research it. And I thought it was interesting that this was a, a place that the Shakers believed this would happen. Um, also really fun about Rollingswood's location is it's really close to the relocated Shaker Cemetery. Um, for people who are familiar with Shaker Heights on parts of South Park, uh, that's where the cemetery was around the corner from Lee Road and they exhumed the bodies and moved them. Um, so that they could do a bigger development on the border of Cleveland Heights. And um, so in 1909, they moved all the graves. And so this graveyard, which looks like something straight out of a horror movie, um, is right next to my grocery store. It's sort of hidden by some hedges. And, um, you know, they, they, they've got a nice tablet marking it. And there is a rumor that not all the bodies got moved. Um, some of them had been buried for almost 100 years. And, and, you know, some people at the Historical Society were like, you know, some of the numbers don't match up <laughs> with how many graves were supposedly there and how many showed up. Um, so what I found fascinating about going through the cemetery was just reading the names and getting a sense of the people, um, the Shakers who were still around in 1909, they had um, sold the land and moved back to, Lan I think, Lancaster. Um, they were fine with moving the graves. They didn't, they didn't feel like the, the bodies meant anything once the spirit had passed on. So they, they permitted this. Um, but, they, you know, look, just going through it, um, some of the graves date back, you know, quite far. Um, and some of the names got borrowed as I was picking names for some of the characters in the story. 
Um, so that's the background of some of the true history um, to protect the identities of some of the um, murders involved with my research. I don't really give slides for those. I will say doing the newspaper research I did to kind of understand what history a house might have on Lee Road. Um, there was a real murder of a child um, near where Rawlingswood is located. And um, it's a, the house is currently occupied by folks that probably have no idea that, um, that this occurred. And the story of um, the Rawlings family was very much inspired by this, this family um, where the, the husband died during the Great Depression, like under sort of mysterious circumstances after the great crash. And the, the wife kind of declined and their finances were in trouble. And, and the, the official story was that she murdered her son in the attic. And, um, and that story bothered me and I kind of stuck in my craw and I wanted, and I felt bad for that house. You know, um, I did some research into what happens to murder houses where a terrible crime does occur and how that gets handled legally, how it gets handled um, by the real estate agents, like how you address that. And it's kind of fascinating. It varies state by state. And um, usually within five years, the stigma is considered gone. Um, however, you can look up your own house. Several websites are available where you can type in your address and you can find out um, if there was a murder in your house, if you're, if you're curious what the history of your house might be. Because a lot after five years, that information is probably not going to be disclosed. Um, so it, it, I think what fascinated, what really drew me to write the story, and I was talking with Donna at the beginning, was I wanted to look at the house as a character. I wanted to look at the house of Rawlingswood and the, the grounds it was on as sort of a, a narrator, really, in the story and, and what that house goes through um, as the families come and go and tragedies and, and intrigues and problems come and go. Um, cause I, I, I love these houses. Like, I think that's, um, where my loyalty lied a little bit in this story on top of all the characters is I really wanted, um, to know that the history of this house, Rawlingswood and what would happen to it after all it's been through. Um, especially in the modern age where, you know, its insides get ripped out and it gets totally reimagined by a modern family. Um, so that's the inspiration for the story. And what I'd love to do now is open it up for questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing. And uh, thank you guys. I know that was a lot of slides. Um, but I would love to here, um, either put it in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. And Donna, if you've got some questions, if you want to facilitate, that would be fine. Um, I think we got we got about 15 minutes, so I did good. <laughs> Usually I go on a little too long. So um, I hope that was helpful. I know that was a lot of talking and it's so weird doing this, you guys, without being able to see your faces and not knowing if you're if I'm putting you to sleep or if, if you're following along. But so how did I do, Donna? Did you find that it was, helpful? It was great. I mean, I felt like when you wrote it, that definitely the house was a character. When I read it, the house was definitely a character. And and when I was reading it, I just, I felt like I was in the house. I really did. It was how you described it. And then, I mean, everything was descriptive in the novel, all the characters, but the house, I really did feel like I was, was in the house and I could see all the rooms and the blood on the floor and the ghosts and everything. It was, <laughs> you know, that was true that that house that I toured that had been vandalized. Okay. In the second floor, we go up there and I walk into this bedroom. There is a dirty mattress on the ground with, you know, cigarette butts or whatever, but a huge blood stain on the floorboards. And then it's, and then drag marks into the bathroom, like where it's like, a, it looked like a dead body had been dragged. And then there was like all kinds of staining in that bathroom. And I remember being in that room and, and looking for the police. I'm like, where's the crime scene tape? Like, where's the chalk outline of the body? Like what, what happened here? And it was bizarre. I mean, this house was being sold as is. So the real, you know, the real estate company were just repping for the bank. I mean, who remembers back in 2008, remember all the foreclosures and all the bank owned properties and um, 
the banks weren't paying attention. They weren't fixing up the houses nice to get a good price. They were just, you know, putting them out there. And um, I was shocked that, I mean, I write about murder and stuff, but like walking in and seeing that on the floor, it really freaked me out. I was, I felt like I just walked onto a movie set. I'm like, oh my God, somebody really got hurt here and I hope they're okay. But we never were able to find out what happened. And um, it's, it's bizarre. I've gone into, we went into several bank owned homes during the 2008 um, when we were shopping because they were, the prices were great, but usually they needed hundreds of thousands of dollars in repairs because there was some major problem. Um, and in this case, it looked like a crime scene. And um, yeah, that, it, that, that was a big <laughs> Dave right? Sounds kind of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, I, I wrote an essay um, about touring that home that when I have a little more time with readers, they'll sometimes read during these talks. Um, but uh, crime scene or crimereads.com has, I could try to find the link and put it in the chat, um, has an article I wrote about touring that house and exactly how I felt about it. I felt like I was walking through Shirley Jackson's imagination. Um, Haunting of Hill House was a huge inspiration uh, in this book. I, I, you know, I don't claim to do what Shirley does with that story, but I love the way she made the house come alive. I love the way um, Shirley Jackson and also Edgar Allan Poe and House of Usher, like, sort of personified the building as a living, breathing entity that had malice and had plans and had feelings. Um, I found that I found that interesting. So I'm trying to think what other um, ghost story by Peter Straub was another book I read uh, in my research for this. I read several ghost stories, Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Um, I actually taught a little reader's class for um, Literary Cleveland on ghost stories. And that was one of the books we covered. Um, it's, it's a novella. It's really short. And it's written in like the very grand old English kind of, you know, it's heavy writing, Henry James, but that is what considered one of the original um, haunted house stories. And it's fascinating. It also is one of the first books that I'm aware of that um, made children creepy. <laughs> so if you're into ghost stories, I do highly recommend Turn of the Screw. Um, it's a fast read and it's, wow, it's launched a hundred books. I mean, there's a lot of books that that copy or or mimic some of the things. Um, most recently, Ruth Ware's Turn of the Key, which was excellent. I, um, I would say if you enjoyed No One's Home, Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware is another book that I would check out. It was largely inspired by Turn of the Screw, but modernized. And um, it was, I thought she did a fabulous job with it. It was very spooky, the way she brought that house to life. Um, but that was a classic Gothic story of the young governess coming to the home to take look after the children, and then she gets terrorized by the like the powers that be uh, inside the house. Um, I'd say that most of my stories have that element to it, that element of a Gothic. Um, I would say even the Dead Key, which was a bank building was loosely, if you look at it, kind of a haunted house story. It, it was a large foreboding structure with secret passages and, and secrets and, and dark deeds and powerful men. Usually a Gothic ghost story will have a powerful rich man um, who's dark and nefarious and tormenting your young innocent uh, protagonist. Um, I'd say that that a lot of my books have elements of that. Um, so it's kind of funny when you deconstruct. Um, the classic ghost story shows up over and over again in some of the structures of what I write. Um, yes, the stone steps, I'm looking at the trap right now. Yes, the stone steps were creepy. I tell you what, I could write a hundred ghost stories just going house by house in my neighborhood. Like there are so many cool, creepy little places in Shaker Heights. Um, and gorgeous homes. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love, I think they're beautiful. Um, but I think some of the houses are sad. Like they, some of them aren't, a lot of them are well-kept, but some look like they've been, you know, let go a little bit. Um, I think some of them feel very empty, uh, again, because they were built to house twice the people that are living there now. Um, 
And you know, one of the challenges we faced during the housing crisis was some of these big, ha- bigger houses were harder to sell. Like a family of four like mine doesn't need seven bedrooms. So um, I think that's one of the challenges that parts of Detroit, parts of Pittsburgh, parts of Cleveland, where these old houses are, it's one of the challenges is how to modernize the house. Um, let's see, if I tried writing short stories or novellas, that's an interesting question from Carla. Actually, I had a short story last year get produced into a short film by Cleveland Playhouse. Um, The short story I wrote was called The Christmas House and it was for the holiday season when they were trying to do online productions. Um, Think about the pandemic, like we were all trying to figure out what to do and, and theater companies and theaters in general were trying to figure out how to connect with their audiences. So I had the chance to work with a young filmmaker and an animator and a couple of really awesome young act- actors. Like they did all the work together. I got to write the, the story it was based on, but it was, um, that was really fun. I wish I did more uh, short stories. I've, you know, this light, my fifth book, which is in the drawer right now was actually kind of a collection of short stories all about the same murder. And, um, that's probably the closest I've come since the Christmas house to, to doing that. Uh, but that book was, it's tough. If you think there's a lot of characters in no one's home, book five, which again, I, I wrote it and then I ended up putting it away. Um, it had, because it was a collection of short stories, there were so many, I think it was a real challenge um, for readers. And I am using parts of that, but I love the idea of a short story collection all about the same crime. I think that would be a fascinating project to take on. Um, Someone wrote, did you come across Dr. Sam Shepard and the house he lived in? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, the, 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 you know, the basis of the fugitive TV show, Sam Shepard and, and you know, the guy that got away with murdering his wife, or at least we all think he got away with it. We're not sure. Um, it's a famous case. I haven't delved into it. I did see parts of it, like as I was looking at my research and I have been to um, that house and I think they moved the family's house. Gosh, where was I? It was in like South of Cleveland an artist colony, it's on the tip of my brain where I know it was um, part of Sam Shepard's family. Like I was, I was in that house. Um, you know, I feel like that story was done, was done well. I mean, the fugitive I think was told very much from his perspective. And I think he was a consultant on that story. Um, it would be interesting to see a different take on it, but, um, but I, haven't, I haven't found the thread that, that struck, stuck with me yet on that. Um, someone, this background, okay. I will talk about my next book um, in just a second. Someone asked, with all the changes in renos in downtown Cleveland, are you going to write any more about the old buildings like in the Dead Key? Um, yeah. You know, I have the beginnings of a story idea of a set in a high rise downtown. Um, this kind of ties in with the question before that from Robert Muller. Um, about my next book. So I am in the process of uh, doing revisions on my seventh novel, which has a series potential. Um, I'm developing this character that's an engineer, kind of going back to um, what worked for me in my first book. My first character, Iris Latch, was an engineer very much like me. And I really connected with her and I was able to see the story through her eyes because she's, to be honest, she's like a pretty bad version of me in my 20s. <laughs> but so she's worse than I was, but you know, she was inspired by some of the stuff I did. Um, so this this story um, that I'm working on right now is it's an engineer that does home inspections and she stumbles into a house that's been terribly vandalized and big holes cut in the floors and walls as if someone's looking for something. And uh, it turns out the house is where someone was murdered back in the 1960s and um, with a mob connection. And it, it was, it's been fun um, trying to tell the story through this, um, this inspector's eyes. Because I, I worked as an insurance inspector for a period of time when I was um, running my own business. I did adjusting. Well, I wasn't, a, I was a consultant to the adjusters. So 
if a prod, if a house was damaged bad enough or a building was damaged bad enough for an engineer to be called in, um, I would go and take a look. And it was an interesting way to see arsons, to see self-sabotage, like people that drove equipment into their own houses on purpose, people that you know banged up their roof with a hammer trying to get a new roof out of the insurance company. Um, a lot of interesting, bizarre cases and also tragic cases where families you know, got mold all over their house because of a bad contractor. So I, I'm fascinated by this idea. I'm, I'm working on it. And if I do manage to um, turn it into some sort of series, I would love to take this character into downtown Cleveland into a larger building because um, I, I have a lot of stories I would love to tell about some of those buildings. <laughs> so, so we'll see. Um, Right now, uh, I've written three books in the last two years. Um, the fifth book was an experiment and it's sort of stewing. I took parts of it um, in this, this new book I'm working on. And uh, the sixth book in between those um, is being shopped right now. But the market's funny. Like it's been, the pandemic has sort of thrown the entertainment industry a loop. Um, there's been a big backlog of books that like didn't get released last year because all the bookstores were closed. Um, there's been some contraction in the publishing industry. It's a tough market right now. So what I'm doing is in working with my agent, I'm just going to keep writing and, and, and keep working on these stories. Um, I am excited about what's different about the new book I'm working on right now. The, the working title is the riddle house. Um, it has a very strong central character and it doesn't go jumping around quite as much as a book like No One's Home does, uh, which was super fun. I loved going and getting to know all those different fa families. I loved Benny uh, so much. She was my probably my favorite character. Um, of course, I loved Ava as well. I loved the idea of, um, of a girl surviving the way she did. Um, so, but it'll be interesting to see with um, the way readers are and what people are looking for after the pandemic. You know, some of us are looking for lighter stories. Some of us are looking for uh, ways to escape. Um, horror books did great. I mean, apparently in certain sectors, like I don't know what the market's gonna do, but, um, but it's been fun getting to know one character really, really well. Um, and we'll see, we'll see if that's gonna be the thing that, that catches next. But um, for me, so, so right now I'm just writing away and letting my agent fret about what the market's doing and, and we'll see if we can connect. Um, so yeah, no, I've, and there's a lot of great books coming out, by the way, today was a big day. Um, people ask me who my favorite authors are and what I like to read. Um, I'm very excited about Laura Littman's new book, Dream Girl, coming out today. Um, that looks amazing. There's been a couple others. Uh, Megan Abbott, her new book, The, the Turnout, um, is something I'm really looking forward to. I feel like we're living in a very active time for the female crime writer. There are some really top-notch female crime writers working right now. I love Ruth Ware. I love Tana French. I love um, what Karen Slaughter does. I, I And Laura Littman writes about Baltimore the way I want to write about Cleveland. And um, and I've really become a huge fan of hers. So you might want to check out her latest. Um, I will try to get, Donna, I was not with the talking. I couldn't jump online to get links. But if I sent you links to the Christmas house and um, to that Crime Reads article about the inspiration for No One's Home. Would you be able to get that to everybody? If, yeah, I, I'll figure out, I'll find out how to do it. And if not, we can put it on our Facebook page. So people okay. can check on our Facebook page. Okay, yeah, I would love to, it's kind of, I would love to just pop it up right now, but let me make a note to myself to do that. Um, I'll do it as soon as we, we, we sign off here. Um, so thank you guys for your time today. And uh, if I'm a little scattered, please forgive me. <laughs> no <laughs> had, explanation needed. <laughs> I have a broken sewer line between my house and the street. And uh, it's been, I, I'm working on three hours of sleep here, but it was so wonderful to see you all. And thank you for your questions. I wanna make sure I got to all of them. We got the Sam Shepard one. 
Okay. Oh, there's an engineer stuck in his cubicle right now, Dave. I feel for you. Um, Dave, uh, you know, working in a cubicle like I did uh, right out of school for a couple of years. Um, well, let's just say it made me jump off the sides of buildings. And that's, I, I switched jobs to restoration work and inspection work because sitting in a desk like that was just murder for me. Um, I, so I ended up becoming the Indiana Jones of engineering for a while and I have a full body harness and I literally jumped off the sides of buildings and rode down on swing stages because it was fun. Like I got to go into the loading docks. I got to go up in the attic spaces, the crawl spaces, the you know, spaces under the buildings, the tunnels, um, tunnels, tunnels make an appearance in a couple different places in my work. Um, even the sewer systems, like I, I was, it's amazing to me um, how much of the built world most people don't get to see firsthand. So what I try to do in my books is show you guys sort of behind the curtain on, on some of these buildings as well, because it, in no one's home, there are all kinds of places for a person to hide that I've seen in my work as an engineer, but you might not know even exists. So it was really fun. I hope I got a chance to show you um, the darker side of a building like Rawlingswood. So we're 801, Donna, I think we did it. Yep. Thank you very much. It's been great. There's all kinds of comments on what a wonderful evening it was. So glad you could very, join very us nice. and hopefully we very, can very have you back good. for another book. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank everybody you. for coming. Oh.